I'm Anu Ojar from the National Space Centre in Leicester. When it comes to space firsts, everyone has got their own individual top five, and the choice ranges from so many different aspects of space science. Whether you're thinking of the first woman to walk in space, Svetlana Savitskaya, to the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, we need to remember that the choices for space science go way beyond human spaceflight. Space science, to my mind, has three different parts. There's looking out there, astronomy. There's going out there, exploration with robotic and human spacecraft. And also the part that's often overlooked, satellite applications. Those satellites whose primary focus isn't looking out there, but it's looking back here. Space science for the benefit of life on Earth. So here are my top five space firsts in space science. Coming in at number five is the world's first truly global satellite navigation system, the American GPS constellation. Since 1978, with the launch of the first experimental satellite in this program, we now rely on the timing signals for GPS, not only to navigate using our sat-nav systems, but in everything from regulating electrical power systems to time-stamping international financial bank transfers. The GPS system has enabled so many services that we rely on take for granted in our 21st century way of life. And without it, the global economy would grind to a halt in less than 24 hours. In fourth place on my list was the first ever space shuttle mission not to launch the Hubble Space Telescope, but to service the Hubble Space Telescope. This was STS-61 in December of 1993, the mission that saved Hubble. Hubble has transformed our understanding of the universe at all scales, from the solar system to the galaxy to the wider cosmological study of the entire universe itself. And everyone has their favourite Hubble images. From Hubble, we've seen, when we look at this image of M16, the pillars of creation, the birth of stars. We've seen the death of stars. Look at the beauty of NGC 6543, the Cat's Eye Nebula. And we've had wonderful images in unparalleled clarity of entire galaxies, like this beautiful one of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. And of course, the transcendental impact of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, looking at a tiny scrap of empty sky and seeing 10,000 galaxies, each containing 100,000 million stars plus. You know, Hubble has really proven to us that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches of planet Earth. And if it hadn't been for STS-61, none of these discoveries would have been made. For my number three, I've chosen the United States Landsat program. Now, there had been other Earth observation satellites before, but this was the first integrated program to look at the entire surface of the Earth in terms of land use in different wavelengths, ranging from those wavelengths the human eye can see in visible light, going into infrared and other wavelengths as well. The first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972, the eighth one in 2013, and the program is still going strong with the next satellite due to launch in 2021. And over those 40 plus years, the Landsat program has not only completely changed our understanding of land use around the planet, it has led to other programs led by other countries and other agencies to try to add to our understanding of how space science can benefit us here on Earth through study of our land surface. And in second place for me is the Viking program, the first successful landings on the surface of the planet Mars in 1976. This is really personal to me because I remember the launch of Vikings 1 and 2 in 1975. And I remember so clearly as I think I was just below eight years old, um, the landings in the summer of 1976. The Viking landers showed that we could not only land successfully on the surface of Mars, they changed our understanding of the atmosphere, our understanding of the surface, and for the first time, we conducted life science experiments looking 
for signs of extraterrestrial life on the surface of another world. So Viking left its legacy when we look at all of the other successful Mars landers that have followed in its footsteps. And of course, this summer, we're going to see the American Perseverance rover, the follow-up to Curiosity. We're going to see the Amal orbiter, around Mars from the United Arab Emirates Space Agency, and of course China's first Mars mission, a really ambitious orbiter rover lander. But in overall first place to me, you can't beat the only spacecraft that has ever conducted the classical grand tour of the solar system, Voyager 2. The Grand Tour was a concept that was first explored in the mid-1960s at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory when it was discovered that if you use the right gravity assists, so flying close to one planet to change your trajectory and slingshot yourself to the next planet, there was a once in 175 year opportunity in the mid-1970s to conduct the Grand Tour. The program was initially called Mariner Jupiter Saturn. Two spacecraft were built. They were both renamed as Voyagers 1 and 2 just before their launch in 1977, and it was Voyager 2 as the backup for Voyager 1 that conducted the Grand Tour. Flying by Jupiter in July of 1979, Saturn in August of 1981, and then in 1986 with Uranus and in 1989 with Neptune, Voyager 2 conducted the only ever spacecraft flybys of the two ice giants of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune. Now, more than 40 years after launch, Voyager 2 is still heading out into interstellar space. It's still transmitting data back to Earth, but at a tiny rate, it's only 160 bits per second. And right now, it is about four times the distance of Pluto from the Sun. With Voyagers 1 and 2, with New Horizons, with Pioneers 10 and 11, Humanity has sent spacecraft into interstellar space that are never going to come back. In, in millions of years, they're going to be circling the heart of the galaxy. But for me, of all of those five interplanetary spacecraft, it's Voyager 2 that's got a really, really special place.